Well, welcome, and uh, thank you for joining us for the great debate series here in Michigan. Tonight's topic is central to the truth of the Christian faith, the resurrection of Jesus. According to 1 Corinthians 15, if Jesus was not raised, then our faith is useless as Christians, and, our, and we are false witnesses about God. So tonight's debate is extremely important. It is foundational to the truth of Christianity. Before we begin again, I would like to say, please, cell phones, maybe take one last time to check, make sure they're on vibrate or they are off. And I think that is all I have announcement-wise, so let's get to our debaters. Our Muslim apologist today is Osama Abdullah. He is the founder and director of www.answering.com. Dash Christianity.com. He is married. He has a lovely wife and son, and I believe they are with us here today. I see his wife is here. Thank you for coming. And he has a master's in computer science. Our Christian apologist is Dr. Nabil Qureshi, who is co-founder of Acts 17 Apologetics Ministry. He, he has his medical doctorate from East Virginia Medical School and his Master's of Christian Apologetics from Biola University. Nabil's website can be accessed at www.answeringmuslims.com. Our format tonight is going to be set up as this. Each debater will have 30-minute opening statements. They will then do 15-minute first rebuttals, followed by 8-minute second rebuttals, and 5-minute conclusions. All right, that's all that I have for you. Let's begin with Nabil. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Nabil Qureshi. I'm with Acts 17 Apologetics. And before I begin, I'd like to start with a prayer. For those of you who are Christians in the room, please follow along. For those of you who are not, feel free to do so as well. Holy God, we praise you for being king over our lives. Lord, we come to you in, in worship and reverence, Lord. Everything we do, we do for your glory, God, or at least we should. And we ask that you would take this evening and glorify yourself through it. Praise you and pray in the holy name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, uh, i got to preface this whole debate with an introduction. Uh, I would have to say that yesterday was probably the craziest day of my life. Uh, it was definitely the first time I've ever uh, been uh, a victim of assault and battery by security guards. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a background, we were at the Arab Fest yesterday, and uh, we were simply asking a question. There was a booth there that was giving out pamphlets, and we went to the booth, and we said, we have a camera, can we record you? Ultimately, they said yes, and I said, we have a question, and we started to ask it. Before you know it, security guards were all around us. Uh, I'm really condensing this, but long story short, um, me, my ministry partner, David Wood, and our friend, Mary Jo, were all uh, physically assaulted, and uh, hit multiple times. Um, so, it's been a crazy night, let me say that. Uh, the adrenaline has been pumping ever since yesterday. Uh, we've talked to the media, we've talked to lawyers, uh, we've talked to all sorts of people. Um, long story short, I'm about as fragile as I've ever been before today, um, which, the sum up, bodes really well for you. So, uh, if there's never ever a time to just uh, to, to take advantage of the situation that is today, um, then again, I'll beat you. <laughs> okay, so let us begin. Um, the question today is, did Jesus rise from the dead? As Mary Jo has said, this is extremely foundational to the tenets of Christianity. If Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead, then our faith is in vain. In fact, Romans 10.10 10 lists the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection as one of the clear indications of what we need to believe in order to be saved. So, did Jesus rise from the dead? The question can be addressed in many ways. First and foremost, though, we have to point out that this is a historical question. If Jesus Christ was a man who lived in the first century, which we all say he was, Muslims and Christians alike, then this is a man who lived. Investigating his life is a historical process. It's not something you do only theologically, only philosophically. There are actually historical records. In fact, we have more historical records of the life of Jesus than virtually anyone else from his time in his era. Um, do you all know who the emperor was at the time of Jesus? It was Tiberius. Now, Tiberius is the emperor of Rome. And how many sources do we have on the existence of Emperor Tiberius? 
10. How many sources do we have on the existence of Jesus, a carpenter in a province of that empire? 40. So you have four times as many references to the life of Jesus as you do to, this, uh, to the emperor of his time. That's amazing. So we know that Jesus Christ was a man who can be investigated historically because we have over 40 sources that deal with his existence. Surprisingly, approximately 24 that have to do with his crucifixion, and we'll be talking about that as we go along. So, Jesus was a man who lived in the first century. We're supposed to investigate this question, did Jesus rise from the dead, from multiple perspectives, but first and foremost, it should be from a historical perspective, because the question is historical. It's an event. Did he rise from the dead? That would be an event, so we approach it as history. In order to do this, we're going to look at two types of evidence. We're going to look at direct evidence and supporting evidence. If you're, if you're making outlines, don't outline that. I'm just explaining to you what types of evidence we're going to be using. Direct and supporting evidence. Now, direct evidence is something along the lines of someone saying, Jesus died on the cross, or Jesus rose from the dead. Those are direct evidences for those concepts. If there's a witness who says it, or if there's someone who reports it from a witness, that's direct evidence. Historically speaking, it doesn't get too much better than that. Supporting evidence would be something such along the lines of scholars all believe X, Y, or Z. Now, this is something that's supporting. It's not primary evidence. It's supporting evidence. Or if you look at this verse over here, you can interpret this to mean these sorts of things, if they're not direct statements about Jesus' death or resurrection, are all supporting statements. So we're going to be looking at this, and we're going to be looking at all our evidences and classifying them as we go along, direct and supporting. So, to lay out the argument, I'd like to point out two things. If these two things are true, then we can reasonably conclude that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Number one, that Jesus died on the cross. And number two, that Jesus was later alive. Those are the two facts we're going to discuss. Number one, Jesus died on the cross. And number two, Jesus was later alive. If we can prove or show with, uh, beyond a reasonable doubt that these two things are well defended, then my case will stand very strongly. So first, did Jesus Christ die on the cross? Now, let's look at the direct evidence. First, we have so much evidence that Jesus died on the cross that is mind-numbing. In fact, every single ounce of evidence that we have for the first hundred years after Jesus' death, and most of it beyond that, says that Jesus died on the cross. All the evidence that we have from Jews, such as Josephus, Marabar, Serapion, and the Talmud, these three Jewish sources say Jesus died on the cross. Gentile sources, such as Tacitus, Lucian of Samosata, these are Gentile sources that say Jesus died on the cross. And of course, we have the early generation of Christians who say Jesus died on the cross. For example, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Peter, and the author of Hebrews. All these separate individual authors say Jesus died on the cross. And what about second-generation Christians, such as Papias, Clement of Rome, Polycarp, Ignatius? These are all Christians from within one century after Jesus' death, all of whom say Jesus died on the cross. Now understand what we have. We have an event. This is the event we're studying historically. And every single source that we can possibly investigate all agree that Jesus died on the cross. Keep this in mind as we go further through the evidence. Now, I have just laid out that all the written testimony that we have points out that Jesus died on the cross, but we also have some extremely early written evidence that does the same thing. Paul, for example, was writing just a few decades after Jesus' death, and some of what he includes in his writing were even earlier, and we'll discuss that shortly. Uh, the author of Mark is contested to have written the Gospel somewhere around maybe 50, 60, or 70, but usually a lot of the people that, um, who investigate this issue will say it's as early as 50. Just, again, just a couple decades after Jesus' death. We also have the author of Hebrews who explicitly mentions the death of Jesus Christ. This is the earliest stratum of Christian authors who say Jesus died on the cross. But even earlier than this, uh, if you guys have fallen asleep, come on back up here. Let's, let's, let's pick this up a notch. Even earlier than this, we have creeds. Creeds found in the earliest Christian writings, which go back to the very first generation of Christians. Now I'm talking predating the actual writing of the New Testament. Well, what does this mean? We have creeds in the New Testament that predate the writing of the New Testament? Well, yes. For example, in Philippians 2, we have the Carmen Christi. Now the Carmen Christi is a song of sorts. It's, it's, an, it's a hymn, it's a creed, which shows what Jesus did um, as he was first God, who did not believe that deity was something to be held on to, but emptied himself, made, him, made himself in the form of a man, a servant. Uh, who would die on the cross. This statement here is the beginning of the Carmen Christi. And if you examine 
the words in the common Christian, you'll notice that this is a uh, creed that Paul is quoting from before him. In fact, this isn't something that he makes up uh, because we know that the way he approaches this creed, it, it assumes that the church at Philippi is very well familiar with this creed. In fact, uh, Larry Hurtado, um, scholar of uh, Christology in England, has stated that the creed probably predated Paul's conversion to Christianity. And when did Paul convert? In the first two years of, uh, two to three years of the Christian message. He has reasoning for saying that. If someone would like to object to it, we can discuss that. But we have super early information. Now this, like I just said, is two to three years after Jesus died, and it says that Jesus is dead on the cross. That is strong testimony, but is that the only one? No. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 8, also a very early creed. In fact, atheists and agnostic scholars were the ones to determine that this creed was as early as it is. Marcus Borg, one of the most skeptical scholars uh, when it comes to Christianity that is out there, has said that this creed, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 8, is no later than months after Jesus' death on the cross. Months. You cannot get anything earlier in history than that. You're talking about the writing of Alexander the Great hundreds of years after he died. You're talking about the writings about Julius Caesar hundreds of years after he died. Talk about the writings of Muhammad, the prophet of Arabia, hundreds of years after he died. But 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 through 8 says very clearly, Jesus died on the cross, and we have agnostic and atheist scholars saying that this came no more than months after his death. It doesn't get any better than this. The evidence, again, this is direct evidence that is as strong as it can be from multiple sources on multiple strata of history. Now, as I have said, every single uh, piece of direct evidence that we have concerning Jesus' death on the cross all says that he died on the cross, uh, and it, all the ones from within one century after Jesus' death say this. There is nothing, and I mean, this is obviously something you can deduce from what I just said, but there is nothing contrary to the fact that people say he died on the cross. There is no shred of evidence against this. Every single thing says he did, no one says he didn't. Now think about it for a moment. If it were even plausible that Jesus Christ could die on the cross, would not have someone said it. People were looking for excuses to say that he did not rise from the dead. Why not just come up with the idea that he didn't die on the cross? We know, for example, the Jews, according to the gospel, said that his body had been stolen. Well, if they're looking for excuses on him not having died on the cross, or not having risen from the dead, why not just say he survived the cross? Because everyone knew that surviving the crucifixion is impossible. And I'm going to qualify that statement shortly. Uh, you know what? I'll go ahead and qualify it now. When the Romans were crucifying people, they didn't take chances. For, for one, the Roman centurions who crucified people did this for a living. This is their job. They were good at what they did. It's not too hard to kill people if that's what you're doing. It's pretty easy. And they made sure they do it because if a prisoner escaped from crucifixion or the death sentence or even prison, that guard was liable to be killed by his own government. So these Roman centurions were not lax at what they did. They take a lot of care in what they were doing. So we know that the guards can do it easily. They take extra care to do it. And what was the process of crucifixion? First, we know that during the process of crucifixion, the beating was brutal. We have statements from early Christian, I'm sorry, from the early from the Christian era and even earlier who say that crucifixion itself was like the pre-death, the death before dying. It's a scourge. It's it, one person even says that when these victims were crucified, ribbons of flesh were hanging from their body. And what do we know about Jesus Christ? Read the book of John carefully. If you read the book of John, Pilate presents Jesus Christ before the crowd and he says, Here's your man. He doesn't want Jesus to be crucified. But they still want him to be crucified, so he says, let me flog him first. He takes him to be flogged, and then he brings him back saying, what about now? Do you still need him to be crucified? Think about it for a moment. If he was just doing what he expect, they expected him to do, would he have re-asked the question? No. It's quite likely that he actually flogged Jesus to the point of near death, way more than usual flogging, in order to appease the crowd as a substitution for the crucifixion. But they didn't be, they were not appeased, and Jesus was carried on to the cross. What else do we know about crucifixion? I like talking about uh, the medical aspect of it because it's about the only time I get to use my medical degree. Um, 
When Jesus is uh, on the cross, whenever any man is placed on the cross, their arms are hyperextended. In other words, their chest is expanded and it's hard, it is extremely hard to breathe out. They need to somehow uh, pull their arms back in so that their chest can produce that positive pressure in order to breathe out the air. But how do they do that? Imagine you're hanging, your arms are hanging on, you're hanging from your arms on the cross. How in the world are you going to get yourself to bring those arms down? Well, you don't. You push your body up. And how do you do that? By lifting up off your feet. And what is running through your feet? A nine-inch nail. So every time Jesus Christ wanted to breathe out, he had to push up against a nail that's going through both his feet. What is the point of me saying this? The point is that when a, a man is on the cross and he is not pushing up anymore, you know he is dead. And it's not hard to see a man pushing up. This is also the very reason why the two criminals on either side of Jesus uh, had their knees broken. Because simply breaking their knees made it impossible for them to push up off their feet. Which meant they could no longer breathe. Breaking of the knees is one type of death blow that the Romans used in order to kill a prisoner if it was time to kill them. There were other methods, such as crushing their head, letting wild animals eat the body, and of course the one used on Jesus Christ, a spear thrust through the heart. Each of this was meant to be uh, a different method of ensuring the death of the prisoner. And Jesus Christ received a death blow. There is not a single record of anyone in history who has gone through a full Roman crucifixion and survived. Now, there are accounts of people who were pulled off the cross before the death blow who survived. And even then, only after Roman medical attention, the best that they could provide, and even then, um, multiples of them died as well. Two-thirds of them would die as well, without receiving the death blow. So Jesus Christ, on the cross, receiving the punishment designed to kill people in the most painful, humiliating way possible, and you, uh, you have to wonder, would the Romans do a good job of what they're hired to do and what their very life depends on? We can talk more about practice of Roman crucifixion, should a son choose to go in that direction. So what do we talk about? We've talked about the direct evidence uh, so far. We've talked about, number one, all the written testimony says Jesus died. Number two, especially the earliest testimony, which goes within months of Jesus uh, being on the cross. We have nothing to the contrary except possibilities of twisted interpretations, which we will possibly see those come out later. And finally, the practice of Roman crucifixion was guaranteed to kill a victim. And we know Jesus was crucified. If anyone says anything to the contrary, I'd like to see the evidence. However, that's just a direct evidence. We've only begun to talk. Uh, we also have supporting evidences. According to virtually every New Testament historian, I'm sorry, every historical Jesus historian who is alive today, Jesus died on the cross. Virtually no one, and certainly no major scholars who studied Jesus' life, say that he survived the cross. What are the kinds of things these people say? Now, I'm going to quote to you atheists and agnostic scholars who study the death and life of Jesus. Atheist New Testament scholar Gerrit Gudemann declares that Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable. John Dominic Crossan of the infamous Jesus Seminar says that there is not the slightest doubt of the fact of Jesus' death, Jesus' crucifixion under Pontius Pilate. According to Crossan again, that he was crucified is as sure as anything historical can ever be. That he was crucified is as sure as anything historical can ever be. Atheist scholar John Dominic Cross. And Mark Borg, another member of the Jesus Seminar, states that Jesus' execution is the most certain fact about the historical Jesus. Jewish scholar Giza Vermes says that the passion of Jesus is part of history. Another Jewish scholar, Pincus Lapid, said, concludes that Jesus' death by crucifixion is historically certain. And according to Paula Fredrickson, the most single, single most solid fact about Jesus' life is his death. He was executed by the Roman prefect Pilate on or around Passover in the manner Rome reserved particularly for political insurrections, namely crucifixion. Since no discussion of non-Christian scholars will be complete without Bart Ehrman, here's what Bart Ehrman says. One of the most certain facts of history is that Jesus was crucified on the orders of Roman prefect of Judea, Pontius Pilate. 
I can give you a parade of scholars who say that Jesus died on the cross because every single major scholar who writes today says Jesus died on the cross. There is no evidence to say the contrary. Anyone who argues the contrary is arguing from a non-historical perspective, a non-evidential perspective. Anyone, in other words, who's arguing against the death of Jesus Christ is arguing from an alternative agenda. We also have prophecies in the Old Testament of Jesus' death. Uh, we don't need to talk about them right now. I think the historical approach is more than enough, but if someone would like to come in that direction, he can feel free. So we had two pieces of evidence that we were going to discuss today. Number one, that Jesus died on the cross, and we have amply ascertained that he did. There is no reason to think otherwise. And number two, that he was alive later. Now that's a big leap to make. How can we just assume that he was alive later? Isn't it possible that people were hallucinating his reappearance? Isn't it possible that he never died on the cross, that he just swooned? Isn't it possible that Jesus had a twin? That is a theory, an alternate theory. Jesus had a twin. Uh, my favorite alternate theory is the super alien theory. Super aliens came and replaced Jesus. Isn't it possible? Well, it sure is. But what does the evidence say? Let's take a look at that. Um, Jesus, the fact that Jesus was alive can be evidenced by three major facts. Let's turn to them now. Number one. The tomb in which Jesus was laid was empty a few days after his crucifixion. Now, there, are, there is direct evidence for this point again. So, allow me to give you the direct evidence and its statements from multiple sources that the tomb was empty after Jesus' death. So, again, we have as good evidence as historically you can get. Statements from people saying, uh, statements from contemporary people, multiple contemporary people saying that Jesus' tomb was empty. Let us now consider the secondary evidence. How much time do I have left, by the way? Ten minutes? The Jerusalem factor. The fact that Jesus' tomb was in Jerusalem made it possible for anyone to check and see whether, the, whether or not the tomb was empty. If people are going around saying Jesus rose from the dead, anyone could have just gone to the tomb and if his body was still there, say, look, he didn't raise from the dead, his body is still here. Therefore, we know, since there were people looking for ways to show that Jesus was not the risen Lord, we know that his, the tomb must have been empty because if it weren't, people would have used that as evidence against his resurrection. Again, this is supporting evidence, but it's strong. Number two, enemy testimony. Again, we hear the Jews say that the disciples stole the body. Someone stole the body and therefore the tomb is empty. Well, if you have the enemies of a certain group agreeing with you, for example, Christians are saying the tomb is empty because he rose. The Jews are saying, no, the tomb is empty because the body was stolen. Well, guess what? You have opposition agreeing with you that the tomb is empty. Maybe for a different reason, but the tomb is empty on all accounts. So there's enemy testimony. And finally, there's the testimony of women. If anyone were going to make up the story of the tomb being empty, they would not have used women as the people who would discover the empty tomb. Why is that? Because in that time in Jerusalem, if any women were to say anything, their testimony was worth nothing. Absolutely nothing. So you could have a hundred women versus one man. If one man says one thing, a hundred women say another. That one man wins the day. That's how little uh, reverence people had towards a woman's um, uh, statements. So why in the world would the story of the crucifixion and resurrection, the story that is meant to change lives across the world, be started by the testimony of women? Well, only if, those, if that story is true. No one would make something like that up. There's no reason to make that up. There's nothing to gain from saying that women um, were the ones who found him. And therefore, uh, the testimony of women is more supporting evidence for the fact that the tomb was empty. So we have our first piece of evidence supported by direct and supporting evidence that, the tomb, uh, that Jesus was alive later. Let's look at the next link in the chain. Jesus was believed alive by his followers. After Jesus was dead, he was later believed alive. The disciples, we all know this, disciples preached that Jesus died and that they wouldn't, and uh, later they believed that he was risen. In fact, they started worshiping him as the risen Lord. In fact, they then later went on and died for that belief, preaching it. They died for that belief. Now, who, in the right mind, would die for something that is a lie? The disciples were in a position to know whether or not they had seen the risen Jesus. They wouldn't die for a lie. So, if they saw the risen Jesus, I'm sorry, if they died for the belief that Jesus was risen, they at least believed that he was risen. They wouldn't die for something that they thought was a lie. 
However, we also see, um, oh, and I can uh, give you some supporting evidence. So that's the direct evidence that they preached that Jesus had died and that he had risen. The supporting evidence, of course, is a scholarly consensus again. Garrett Lugamont says, It may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. So Gerd Ludemann agrees, Paul Fredrickson says, I know in their own terms what they saw was the raised Jesus. And Bart Ehrman says, it is a historical fact that some of Jesus' followers came to believe that he had been raised from the dead soon after his execution. So, the fact is that he was believed to be alive by his followers. Again, this is something that all historians agree with. Finally, Jesus' opponents believed that he was risen Let's get the direct evidence for that as well. Paul states very clearly that he believed Jesus was risen. And we know that Paul, from multiple sources, that Paul was an enemy of Jesus during uh, the early phase of Christianity. So someone who was Jesus' enemy then turns around and says, I have seen the risen Jesus. Well, why would he say such a thing? We'll get to that in a moment. That's the direct evidence we have that there were enemies of Paul who believed he was risen. But we also have supporting evidence. James, the brother of Jesus, is said in the book of Acts to have been a leader of the church in Jerusalem. But how in the world would James have been a leader of the church of Jerusalem if he was an enemy of Jesus during the Gospels? And we know he was. Well, we can infer that he believed in the risen Jesus. And we actually see this confirmed in extra-biblical sources. Finally, the Jews uh, saying that Jesus' body was gone is more support that he was not in the tomb anymore, therefore potentially risen. So what we have is direct and indirect evidence supporting three facts. Number one, the tomb was empty. Number two, that he was believed to have been seen by his disciples. And number three, that enemies of Jesus believed that they saw Jesus risen. So let's take these facts. If you've been following along, let's connect the dots. What in the world does all this mean? First, Jesus died on the cross. We know that. Two, his tomb was then empty. Three, his uh, believers or his followers said they saw him risen, or at least they believed it. And four, his opponents believed that they saw him risen. What can account for these four facts? Only one thing, that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. Nothing else can account for these facts. For example, the number one opposing theory espoused by people who do espouse a theory is called the hallucination theory. Approximately 5% of scholars who investigate the historical Jesus have this theory uh, that they espouse. They say that multiple people must have hallucinated the, uh, the coming of Jesus, and therefore they believe to have seen him risen. Um, and this is how the Jesus story began. Well, this doesn't quite fit the story, because we know that multiple hallucinations, a mass hallucination, has never happened. It's never happened any time in history. In fact, it seems that in order to circumvent the miracle of Jesus' resurrection, they have to create a miracle of mass hallucinations. So this mass hallucination theory doesn't work on that account, but also, why in the world would Paul, a persecutor of Christianity, and James, an enemy of Christianity, hallucinate the risen Jesus? There's no reason. There's no motive. There always is an underlying reason for hallucination. Uh, at least that's what I've been taught in medical school. And if people do not have this underlying motive, then there is no reason to think that they hallucinated him whatsoever, especially if there's no evidence. So, the resurrection, however, fits all four facts. That, number one, he was killed. Number two, the tomb was empty. Number three, his followers believed him risen. And number four, his enemies believed him risen. The resurrection fits all four of those facts very well. And by the way, scholars across the world agree with these four facts. Jesus scholars. The first fact is believed that Jesus died on the cross by virtually all scholars. The second fact, the empty tomb, is agreed upon by about 75 to 80 percent of Jesus' scholars. Number three and four, that his believers believed him to have been risen and his opponents believed to have seen him risen. Those two facts are believed by over 95% of scholars who write upon the risen Jesus. Agnostic, atheist, Christian, you name it. So these four facts are agreed upon by everyone virtually, and if Osama wants to reject any of these facts, then I appreciate a reason why he's going against virtually everyone's opinion. So, what do we have in conclusion? Number one, Jesus died. And number two, he was risen. It is my understanding that Osama will probably focus on, number one, Jesus' death on the cross. Because the Quran says in chapter 4, verse 157, that Jesus was not killed, nor was he crucified, but was made to appear to them, or to the people who were there. Um, this is the Islamic position. 
Note, there is no evidence for this position whatsoever. There's no reason to believe it. There's no uh, direct evidence. There's no early evidence. There's nothing of the sort which would cause you to believe this except that Muhammad and or the Quran said it. It's the only reason you believe it. And I challenge Osama to provide me a reason otherwise. Um, the other objections I'm expecting Osama to bring, and uh, I will allow him to bring it, um, are objections from the Old Testament. Uh, it's uh, an attempt to take verses of the Old Testament to try to show that Jesus did not rise from the dead. Um, that, I'm sorry, that Jesus would not die on the cross. Uh, we will allow him to, to do that if he wishes. Keep in mind, though, as he's presenting these evidences, note what he will be saying. He will be saying things along the lines of, look at this verse. Clearly, this man would not die. However, those verses generally do not apply to Jesus at all. They're applying to a general statement. They're not prophecies about the Messiah. So watch the verses that he'll bring. See if these are statements about the coming Messiah or about men who are just attempting to pray to God. Also see if what he's saying actually is reflected in the text. Sometimes, uh, I debated with someone in my hometown not long ago, uh, we debated on the topic of the science in the Qur'an, or the miraculous nature of the Qur'an. And many times I noticed that Osama would read scripture and interpret it to mean something it did not say at all. So watch for that as well during his opening statement. I'm hoping uh, that he has an excellent case because I would love to see good arguments against the risen Jesus just so we can sharpen our swords. Um, Osama, I will now turn the floor over to you.